Hi guys, welcome back. This is Mad Chat 122, featuring the fourth and final segment of my interview with Josh, Josh Mandel. In this part of the interview, we talk about his time with Sega of America, what it was like to be the voice of King Graham, what he thinks of AGD Interactive and remakes in general, and much, much more. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Josh Mandel. So Josh, you've also worked uh, for Sega, Sega of America. I know you have some uh, interesting stories about them. So uh, what was it like working for Sega? Well, it was at first extremely exciting. I'd never worked on a, on a console uh, for a console game uh, system before. This was going to be, I was, I was brought in specifically to help uh, develop first party titles for the Dreamcast, which was not out yet. It was going to be launched within the year. And we kept trying to, we, we would work with these outside developers, they would pitch games to us, we also had games internally we were working on, and they would come up with these wonderful concepts. Uh, the, um, the American management would say, oh, this looks good, but for final approval we had to go uh, to uh, Sega in Japan, which owned Sega of America. And Sega of Japan w- routinely turned down every single game that we we tried to start up, or they would let it develop for a few months, uh, and then they would they would cancel it. And finally, we said to them, "Why can we not get a single game uh, uh, produced to completion for you?" And Sega of Japan said. We really only want sports titles uh, for the Dreamcast from America. The other kinds of titles we will provide. Uh, because I guess, and I wasn't there during this, but I guess there had been some some ill will about games that had been developed back in the Genesis days or the Saturn days, I'm not sure. Uh, but for whatever reason, the Japanese management did not want American adventures or action games, just sports games. And that was a different division. So they were basically saying to us, don't bother giving us any more action games or adventure games uh, or any games other than sports games. We're not, we're not going to be interested. Well, that was our division. We were there to do action and adventure games. And they, they, we said, well, then why are we here? And they said, well, it is important to create the atmosphere that shows that Sega is serious about developing American first-party games for the Dreamcast. But that was really just an illusion. So it became very clear to us, uh, to, to me, about six months after I got there, that there was no point in working on these games because they weren't going to say yes. They wanted the division still there, still operating, to present this facade, but um, uh, we knew that there was no point in working, so uh, we all left because there was nothing to do but sit behind a desk, and collect a paycheck, and make games. And uh, as as I'm fond of telling people, that was about a year of my life that was um, almost as wasted as any of the years in college. I wonder if that attitude was what uh, led to, or at least contributed to, the uh, failure of the Dreamcast. I I don't know. That's uh, those failures were at a much higher level in the company than than where I was operating. But it's it's a reasonable guess. Well, speaking of consoles, I've always wondered why, even though with this current generation, there's not more pure adventure games uh, for things like the 360. Especially the Wii, you know, I keep thinking with the the Wii's control scheme, it would seem uh, you know open up a lot of possibilities. But you know, why is it that uh, the console markets have seemed so resistant to uh, pure adventure games? Uh, I don't know, but I would assume it has something to do with the pedigree of of consoles, which was originally to bring the arcade experience home, not to move the computer experience uh, to the TV. So I think that publishers are leery of adventure games. Uh, they look at the history of adventure games. They see it as a niche market. And um, they see that their hardware is 
not as well suited for um, slow, thoughtful exploration as it is for running, jumping, kicking, and punching. That's, I'm just surmising. For some reason, I'm imagining this King's Quest or Space Quest as a first-person shooter and trying to, <laughs> trying to get that image out of my head. You know, <laughs> it's probably been considered many times. I'm sure that a lot of developers had said, hey, we could fire up Space Quest again. We'll just make it a, a, a first-person shooter. And you could actually do some fantastic comedy that way, but it would take a, uh, a visionary uh, developer and a visionary publisher to sign on to doing something like that. <laughs> That's All right, it. I have a, another question here from a fan, uh, Josie and uh, Manuel, or Manuel. Yeah, he wants to know, how was your experience working for AGD Interactive in the remake of King's Quest, and, and what do you think about the indie community reviving those games? Um, I'm of two minds on it. Well, first of all, to answer the first question, I loved working for them. I mean, they were, uh, AGD uh, was creative and driven and very open to letting me, oh, expand uh, uh, King Graham's vocal repertoire a little bit. Um, you know, I could start to, uh, although I wanted to keep Graham sounding familiar to people who knew and loved Graham and King's Quest V, I also wanted to show that he does not have to be as one-dimensional as he came off. Um, so it was a, a pleasure to work for them and a pleasure to work uh, for the indie game community. I love the indie game community. Uh, I support them in, in every way that I can. Um, generally, when someone says, will you, will you lend a voice or something, I, I'll say, sure, uh, I, would, I would love to. Uh, the, the side of that that I'm less fond of is that I see these people who are tremendously creative uh, and tremendously driven, and they're doing games that have already been done. And so I said to Tierra back in the day when I was doing stuff for Tierra and for AGD, um, boy, I hope your next game is something original because you guys are certainly capable of it. And it's wonderful that you're keeping these old games viable for a new generation of players, but you will achieve more personal success not by imitating the old games or improving them or expanding on them, but by showing us where your imagination can lead with something brand new. I couldn't agree more with that. But uh, You said you had expanded King Graham's uh, rep repertoire. That's a hard word to say. Yeah, <laughs> no, shouldn't have... Can you give me an example of uh, like a line as it was originally delivered and then the uh, expanded version? Um, I don't remember any specific lines. You want me to just make one up? And... Sure. This, I'm just curious. I want to hear the, the difference. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, it's the difference between... Uh, well, I remember at one point uh, during King's Quest V, he almost drowns. And I remember coming up out, having knowing that he was going to be coming up out of the water uh, all wet and bedraggled, and he would say something like, like, that was close. Uh, oh, oh, my God, that was close. Not oh, my God, but, you know. Um, but because he always had to be buff, it would come out, that was close, or that was close, something like that. I mean, just <laughs> straight out, buff, never down on his luck, you know, never phased. Uh, but with... Um, with the remakes, I've, I've been able to make him sound annoyed when he's annoyed or tired when he's tired or, or um, you know, old and feeble as he should be by now. So what does that as close sound like now? <sighs> that was close. I mean, just, I, I, I don't know, you know, just off the top of my head. I mean, someone who sounds like they've just been through an ordeal. Right, right. Yeah. Sounds much better to me. I, I, I think so, too. All right, so back to, to stories and gaming, uh, just uh, you know, wrapping up here, but I wanted to ask about this. Uh, you said that the online multiplayer games, uh, there was a lot of hype about how they were going to revolutionize uh, the industry, but they really didn't do anything for adventure games. 
and you said that you still find multiplayer games to be a miserable way to tell a story. Uh, so what is it about these games that makes them uh, so miserable for, for narrative? Well, uh, I've, I've, never, I've never changed my view. I've never had reason to change my view that um, a story is best left to a storyteller. Uh, the more you bring in, um, the more you, you eliminate the linearity and, uh, allow the users to, um, wander off, play the game at their, their own pace, uh, the more you give control to them, the more likely the story is to suffer, uh, because you sitting in front of your computer playing you're not uh, uh, necessarily being a good storyteller. Now, you may be entertained, uh, and in fact, you may be more entertained than you would be by, uh, by a story. But um, it's, a, it's an old, old problem for designers. How much linearity uh, do we allow in? Because the, uh, the more the player takes over the story, the less tight the story is going to be, the less well-paced it's going to be, the less... Uh, the less likely you are to have dramatic moments that are properly built up to and resolved. So um, adventure games have always been a balance between linearity and uh, uh, opportunity for the player. Multiplayer games takes that same problem and makes it infinitely worse uh, for the designer. So I'm not saying you can't, can't come up with a highly entertaining game. I'm just saying that from a pure storytelling aspect, if you want a story that really grips you, that grabs you with the right times, um, uh, multiplayer games are an anathema to that kind of experience. All right, I'm, I'm being pelted with tomatoes here. I can feel it. Oh, no, 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 not at all. Not at all. Matter of fact, I think people will be cheering. Oh, good. <laughs> so this is the final question I have for you. Okay. Uh, what are your plans for the future? Well, um, I'm fortunate to be at uh, a time in my life where I don't have to take every opportunity that comes my way. Uh, I like to um, pick and choose the projects that I work on based on how entertaining I think they're going to they're going to end up being. Um, I don't work on a lot of games at once anymore. I used to juggle three games at once. I don't try to do that anymore. Um, I hope to to still be writing humorous games with adventure game overtones uh, for the rest of my life. Um, I, I love doing it and I write, sometimes I, I write game-like documents that I never plan to have see the light of day. I just write them for my own satisfaction. Because I, I think, what if someday I'll meet a developer or a publisher who wants to take a real chance? Um, and other than that, um, I plan to spend a lot of time with my six-year-old and keep cooking and keep doing magic and keep making people laugh. Because that's what I love to do more than almost anything else. Was there anything that you uh, wanted to plug or mention or direct uh, viewers to? Um, no. No, uh, except if they want to go to YouTube and see that old video uh, of my comedy act with uh, Karen McVeigh um, and like leave some comments where that video is posted, that might be a kick to read. Some crossover between the people who know me from uh, gaming uh, and this person, whoever he is, that posted the video and only knows me from comedy that I did 20 years ago on stage. I'll certainly do that. I, I want to thank you very much, uh, Josh, for uh, being with me today and answering all these questions. I hope I didn't grill you too much. <laughs> thank you, Matt. It's It's been a pleasure, and I hope I haven't uh, offended any of my old friends or co-workers or anything like that, which I'm perfectly capable of doing without even realizing it. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a brand new retrospective. Not going to tell you what it is. You're just going to have to wait and see. And I'll follow that with an interview with Jay Barnson, the developer of Frayed Knights, 
the Skull of Smackdown. It's great stuff. If you haven't seen that game, you should check it out. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated or contributed to this show. Uh, it really means a lot to me. As you uh, probably know, I release these uh, shows under Creative Commons licenses and also make them freely available at armchairarcade.com. Uh, with no no advertisements or anything like that to worry about so you know if you care about game history if you want to see interviews with these designers and developers uh, chip in a few bucks and i'd really appreciate it and as always i want to leave you with a quotation this time from roberta williams and it goes something like this the adventure games the adventure game genre will never die no more than any genre of storytelling will ever die see you guys next week